I look at how the recent rise in work from home reshaped household housing demand, the structure of the city and inequality. My work is about how firms adjust to a tightening in access to credit. My analysis reveals that climate change is intrinsically redistributive through its effect on the cost of borrowing. My research studies how quantitative easing induces investors to rebalance from government bonds into corporate bonds. I explore why it is that firms have increased the size of their excess production capacity since the 1960s and how this can help explain the flattening of the Phillips curve. In my research, I study how banks choose their balance sheet structure and how this choice affects the macro transmission of interest rate risk. My work explores how state-dependent pricing shapes cost push inflation in the production network economy. I use micro data on firms to address questions about long-term productivity growth and innovation. Our paper studies how firms adjust prices after cost increases, to what extent beliefs about the shock duration and competitive pressure shape firms' pass-through, and what this implies for monetary policy. I find that shocks to US versus Eurozone safe assets trigger very different rebalancing flows, suggesting different international spillovers from the two areas' monetary policy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to introduce the first of our 10 finalists of this year's Young Economist Prize, Anastasia Antonova. Hi everyone, my name is Anastasia Antonova. I am a PhD student at the Ex-Marseille School of Economics and uh, my project focuses on the role played by state-dependent pricing in shaping cost-push inflation in a production network economy. So the main feature of state-dependent pricing frameworks is that the degree to which prices are flexible depends on the size of the shocks that hit the economy. And in my work, I uh, show that this state-dependent pricing feature uh, shapes cost-push inflation in very important ways. Uh, it may affect the size, but also it may reverse the sign of the cost-push effect. Uh, for instance, uh, we might have a situation where our Calvo model gives us negative cost-push effect, but the corresponding state-dependent model would, gives, uh, would give us positive cost-push effect. And then, given this striking theoretical result, uh, I uh, evaluate quantitatively whether state dependence is important in shaping the cost push effect in the US. And uh, for that, I first estimate the degree to which pricing is state dependent uh, in each sector of the US economy. And then I evaluate the importance of this empirical degree of state dependence. And it turns out that uh, state dependence is indeed very important for the cost push effect in the US. And uh, notably after the COVID crisis, uh, the state dependent pricing model would give uh, a completely different sign sometimes of the cost push effect compared to a corresponding non-state dependent pricing model. Thanks a lot. Hello. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Clement Bohr, and I just completed my PhD at Northwestern University. So in my paper titled Capacity Buffers Explaining the Retreat and Return of the Phillips Curve, I show how the decline in capacity utilization rates since the 1960s has contributed to the flattening of the Phillips Curve. And I do this at arguing that because firms face capacity constraints in the short run in production, they have a precautionary motive to hold some excess capacity to buffer against fluctuations in demand. And the size of this capacity buffer, in turn, influences the sensitivity of their pricing decisions to variation in demand, where the larger the capacity buffer, the less sensitive firms' pricing decisions will be. So when you combine that with the fact that firms' capacity buffers have approximately doubled in size since the 1960s, well, then you get a substantial reduction in the sensitivity of firms' pricing decisions, thereby flattening the Phillips curve. 
I also argue that what induced firms to want to hold these larger capacity buffers was a rise in the markups that the firms were able to set, where these larger markups implied larger foregone profits for the firms that are associated with becoming capacity constrained. Okay. And lastly, I apply this capacity buffer framework to the COVID-19 pandemic, where I show that the shift in demand from services over the goods combined with restrictions to uh, production capacity to restrict the, the spread of the virus, together can account for all the initial surge in inflation, along with this sudden but temporary steepening of the Phillips curve. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Arnaud Dièvre. I'm a PhD candidate at the London School of Economics. And in my research, I investigate the determinants of long-term productivity growth. In particular, I study whether the mix between public and private R&D matters for productivity growth. I find that it does, and to do so, I proceed in three steps in my paper. I study 70 years of data on patents and firms, and I find that publicly funded R&D differs from privately funded R&D in three main ways. The first is that it is much more fundamental in that it relies much more on scientific publications. The second is that it tends to be much more impactful, much more ahead of its time. And the third difference is that it generates much more technology spillovers. Then I estimate the causal impact of publicly funded R&D on private firms' productivity. And I find that this impact is large, persistent, and two to three times as impactful as privately funded R&D spillovers. Eventually, I calibrate a model of growth with heterogeneous firms and two types of research, basic and applied, and I find that the decline in publicly funded research in the US over the last 60 years can account for one third of the deceleration in TFP growth. Hello, everyone. My name is Manuel Menkov, and I'm doing my PhD at the IFO Institute and University of Munich. Let me also mention that I'm on the job market this upcoming season with yet another paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. OK, let me keep going. <laughs> so in the joint uh, paper with Isabel, we aim to improve the understanding of firms' price settings, so a core question in monetary economics. Specifically, we study how firms adjust prices after cost increases by directly eliciting pass-through over multiple horizons in response to the same initial shock. So main advantage of our approach is that we are combining this quantitative measure with firms' beliefs captured in surveys and the usage of experimental methods. So we apply the survey approach um, with German firms, first in the field exploiting the global supply shock in 21-22, and second in survey experiments where we confront firms with hypothetical cost increases, basically allowing us to vary the nature of the shock, holding all other factors fixed. So we find that firms adjust prices only slowly after cost increases, particularly in the service sector. An important driver here is that firms want to avoid diverging prices from competitors, so-called micro-rigidities. So for example, firms raise prices multiple times in response to a permanent aggregate shock, and they also tell us that competitive pressure, pressure is the number one limiting factor. So we study many other dimensions in the paper, but let me end by highlighting that a nice feature of our approach is that it enables a direct mapping to impulse responses in general equilibrium price setting models. We estimate such a model and find an important role of normal and real rigidities that imply a persistent impact of monetary policy on the macroeconomy. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Cetelina Nenova and I'm a PhD candidate at London Business School. My paper proposes a new way of examining portfolio rebalancing in global bond markets to shed light on monetary policy transmission. The, uh, uh, using a broad as well as granular data set uh, on the portfolio holdings of international mutual funds, I estimate both own and substitution elasticities for a wide range of government and corporate bonds. Um, and this allows me to, in particular, shed light on the different transmission of monetary policies, of monetary policies of the Fed and, uh, and, uh, and the ECB. Um, for example, uh, what I, uh, the, um, 
looking at the Fed monetary policy transmission, the role of the U.S. Treasury, the U.S. safe asset in global portfolios uh, means that global rebalancing uh, by international mutual funds makes the transmission of F Fed monetary policies global. On the other hand, the, the role of the ECB uh, in global bond markets is affected by the regional role of, the, uh, of German bonds in investors' portfolios. Shocks to the returns of German bonds trigger regional rebalancing within the euro area sovereign debt market. That means that substitution elasticities between uh, safe assets and risky bonds are different in those two currency areas. They also differ over time. The substitutability uh, between safe and risky bonds decreases during periods of financial stress, and that means that there is a decrease in the, uh, substitute, uh, in the uh, rebalancing um, uh, in, 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 by, in portfolio rebalancing channel of monetary policies. Um, the, but this, this flight to safety is very different for the U.S. versus the euro area. Uh, it is very much global portfolio rebalancing for the U.S. and regional within the euro area for the ECB. Thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Morgan from UCL London. In the recent years, we've radically changed how and where we work following the widespread adoption of working from home. This raises new issues, as workers might need more space to be productive at home, and they commute to the office less often. Besides, not all occupations are equal in front of remote work. It's a lot easier for us economists than it is for, let's say, nurses. In my paper, I answer the following question. How did work from home reshape households' housing demand? And how will it impact inequality in the short and in the long run? To answer these questions, I start by providing novel empirical evidence on the impact of work from home in London housing market. I then build a dynamic spatial heterogeneous agent model with remote work. In the empirical analysis, I do find that work from home reshaped London house prices by increasing the premium for space and decreasing the commuting penalty. So that is the penalty of living further out. In the model, I find that work from home triggers suburb-wide gentrification. So the workers employed in occupations where work from home is feasible move out from the center to buy larger properties in the suburb. This shifts the relative house prices and rents between the city center and the periphery, and the least wealthy amongst the homeowners get crowded out of homeownership and pushed into renting. So this is gentrification hitting all the suburbs of London at the same time. The second main key takeaway is that work from home gives rise to what I'm calling a tele premium, meaning some extra benefit for the workers employed in occupations where work from home is feasible. Inequality across occupation increased along several dimensions, income, consumption, liquid wealth, and housing wealth, and the workers who cannot work from home experience welfare losses. Hi, uh, my name is Julia Thorgrad, uh, and I just completed my PhD at NYU, and I'm joining the University of Chicago as an assistant professor. Um, so in my paper, uh, I study how quantitative easing lowers firms' cost of capital and the effects this has for the real economy. And I find that central bank purchases are able to significantly lower yields in asset markets other than those the central bank directly purchased in uh, via the portfolio rebalancing channel. Uh, in particular, I find that when a central bank buys government bonds, uh, this induces investors to rebalance heavily into corporate bonds instead, and that rebalancing in turn substantially lowers uh, the yields of these corporate bonds. I also find that firms respond to this greater demand for their bonds due to the rebalancing by subsequently issuing more and at lower yields in the corporate bond market. And importantly, I find that firms use the funds raised to increase their investment. Um, so in the paper, I proceed in four steps to find these results. Uh, first, I construct a novel QE shock that captures unexpected purchases by the Fed of individual Treasury securities during its QE operations. Uh, second, I then combine this security level QE shock with data on investor portfolio holdings to see whether investors rebalance in response to QE shocks, and if so, does this affect um, yields? And I find that it does. 
Um, third, I quantified the aggregate effect of QE on all corporate bond yields by combining my reduced form estimates with a structural model, uh, and I find that $100 billion of QE purchases in the Treasury market lower the typical corporate bond yield by eight basis points on impact, uh, which is a sizable effect. Uh, and fourth, I find that firms respond to this greater demand uh, for their bonds due to rebalancing by subsequently issuing more bonds and at lower yields in the corporate bond market, and they use the funds raised to increase their investment, which is in line with the stated goal of QE, i.e. to stimulate the economy. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Good morning. My name is Eleonora Strappini, and I am from the Halle Institute for Economic Research in Germany. Now, my project is about financial constraints and firms' environmental performance. In the literature, there seems to be growing evidence that high-emitting firms might face tighter financial constraints due to their dirty status, so a carbon premium in equity markets, but also higher rates on loans and in debt markets. So what I want to do in my paper is take a step back and think about the mechanisms that come into play when a high emitting firm needs to adjust to a tightening in financial constraints. What I'm interested in here is how does this firm adjust and what happens to its environmental performance when it does so. So I take an internal capital market perspective on this issue and I propose two potentially contrasting mechanisms. On the one hand, the firm could choose to protect the more profitable side of the business. Now, when the more profitable side is also the dirtier side, then this could lead to a worsening in environmental performance. But if the constraint is also a consequence of the fact that the firm is dirty in the first place, then it could choose to shift funding towards the cleaner side of the business in order to relax the constraint. And then this would lead to an improvement in the firm's environmental performance. Now, why is this relevant here? <laughs> well, if we think of financial regulation in order to manage transition risks in the financial sector, then we can think of several interventions that could actually lead to a worsening in financial constraints for dirtier firms. Now, I would argue that it might be important to consider whether there are spillovers of these interventions on dirty firms' incentives to invest in the cleaner part of their businesses. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine van der Straten, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam. In my paper, I study the effects of climate change and adaptation on housing, income, and wealth in a general equilibrium framework. Climate change enters as an extreme weather event which destroys housing capital as well as the physical capital of the firm. Now I show that the climate damages causes capital to become more scarce in the economy which increases the cost of borrowing on the firm side. On the housing side, there's two effects at play. On the one hand, the exposure to climate risk reduces the house price today. However, as the damages materialize, the supply of livable land falls and causes the housing stock to shrink, which increases the marginal utility of owning housing capital and which increases the price in the long run. Now, I study how households endogenously adapt to climate change. And I show here uh, what the important conditions are to ensure that households ch uh, choose to adapt from a socially optimal perspective, which is crucially that climate risk is accurately, accurately reflected in the house price. Now I go on by looking at how constrained households adapt to climate change and I show that access to finance critically matters because households that are credit constrained become more short-sighted in their consumption choices. Now this causes them to spend less on adaptation given that adaptation only benefits them in the future. Now this causes not only the wealth effects of climate change to be reinforced as these households remain more vulnerable to an extreme weather event and hence lose more housing uh, wealth when they're hit by the extreme weather event, but it also leads to spillover effects to the economy at large, given that it translates into an excess reduction in the supply of houses, which reduces the welfare of next generations, but also causes the next generation to have even stronger incentives to spend less on adaptation as the constraint bites more. Now, in my paper, I finally propose that it's more optimal for the economy if uh, constrained households rent rather than buy housing capital, and I would like to invite you to come to my paper so I can explain you why that's the case. Thank you very much.
Hello everyone, I am Paolo. I obtained my PhD from uh, NYU. So the recent monetary tightening cycle in the US had very large effects on the financial sector. And one explanation for these effects is that the banks in the US shifted their portfolios towards long-term assets over the last decade, taking up substantial exposure to interest rate risk. In the paper, I develop a quantitative theory of bank investments subject to financial frictions to understand how banks allocate their portfolios across assets of different maturities and what are the implications of this choice for the macroeconomy. The key message of the paper is that the increase in the maturity of bank assets strengthened the transmission of interest rate shocks to the financial sector and can account for the large effects of the tightening. I also find that low interest rates in the presence of financial frictions improved the risk appetite of intermediaries and played a key role in driving this shift in portfolio composition of banks. I disciplined the quantitative model using bank level data from the US and I use it to perform uh, policy counterfactuals with respect to bank regulation policies. While uh, mandating banks to hold short-term assets can be beneficial, an unweighted capital requirement that doesn't account for maturity and interest rate risk can actually be counterproductive and make the economy more fragile in the face of sharp tightenings, such as the one we have uh, just witnessed. Thank you very much.